Morning, everyone. My name is Jermani Williams, Chair of the Committee on Housing and Buildings. Sorry for my tardiness in getting this hearing started. Uh, we've been joined by Council Member Rafael Salamanca, and I'm sure we have some others who may still be recuperating from a busy day a few days ago. Uh, we are here to hold an oversight hearing on HPD term sheets. HPD and the New York City Housing Development Corporation use term sheets to define the parameters of specific affordable housing programs for city financed or subsidized projects. Including in the term sheets are the amount of the subsidies that will be provided by the city, the number of units that will be <clears throat> affordable at certain AMI levels, for how long the building will be affordable, and the number or percentage of certain size units in the building. The hearing today will explore those terms and conditions and the process by which the, terms or the, sheets, the term sheets are developed and the impact of these term sheets on developers and individuals seeking housing, in addition to the effects of the new mandatory inclusionary housing program on HPD's term sheets. I'd like to thank my staff for the work they did to assemble this hearing, including Mike Toomey, my legislative director, Megan Chen and Guillermo Pacino, counsel to the committee, Jose Conde, policy analyst to the committee, and Sarah Gasolum, the committee's finance analyst. I'd like to remind everyone who would like to testify today to please fill out a card with the sergeant. And we all know uh, that uh, the affordable housing crisis is probably one of the biggest issues that we're dealing with in the city. Uh, my hope is that understanding these term sheets will help us understand also how it's impacting the mayor's housing plan. Uh, I'm happy in the past few months uh, we have been trying to drive harder to get down to more income targeted low AMIs and hopefully these term sheets will help us do that. If we don't, I don't think we'll address the crisis in the way that everyone is hoping we would. We have been joined by Jordan Press and Molly Park uh, from HPD who will be testifying. I'm glad to see you here. Um, can you please raise your right hand? Do you affirm and tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I, I do. I do. Thank you. And you can begin at your convenience in all of your convenience. Good morning, Chairman Williams and members of the New York City Council on Housing and Buildings. My name is Molly Park, and I am the Deputy Commissioner for Development with the New York City Department of Housing Preservation and Development, HPD. At the table with me is Jordan Press, HPD's Executive Director of Development and Planning with the Division of Government Affairs, who will be available for questions at the conclusion of this testimony. Thank you for the invitation to testify on HPD's updated term sheets, which allow us to implement Mayor de Blasio's historic capital investment in extremely low income, or ELI, and very low income, VLI units. I want to especially thank Councilmember Williams for his continual leadership in pushing for deeper affordability. The Council has been an important partner in fighting for low income housing. We also appreciate the time and feedback from numerous Council offices who participated in meetings and a brown bag briefing on these updated term sheets earlier this summer. The administration has taken historic steps to develop and preserve affordable housing under Mayor de Blasio's Housing New York plan. From the beginning, we set out to achieve deep affordability in Housing New York. With the 10-year plan, we created new programs to reach New Yorkers at lower incomes than ever before, and we have seen the results. Developers are going lower in our mixed income programs, and we are reaching deeper affordability. As of June 30th, 2017, 17,651 units have been created or preserved under Housing New York. This includes 6,533 homeless units and 4,627 senior units to support some of the city's populations most impacted by rising rents. These numbers put us at 39% of our target goal and on track to meet the plan's ambitious objectives. HPD's financing programs use direct capital subsidy, real estate tax exemptions, or both to facilitate the acquisition of property, new construction, rehabilitation, and preservation of affordable housing. Term sheets set the parameters for each of our subsidy programs with our many partners in development finance. They outline eligible borrowers and sponsors, required income and rent tiers, how much financing is available on a per unit basis, equity requirements, design requirements, eligible real estate tax benefits, and other important loan terms. In development finance, uh, term sheets are a critical way to structure and give shape to our programs and to give consistent guidance to our many partners. We updated our term sheets for four reasons. First, we wanted to address several programmatic goals. 
In the mayor's State of the City address in February, he announced an increase of 10,000 units for extremely low-income and very low-income households within Housing New York. ELI units, which are defined as having rents affordable households earning 30% of the area median income, or just under 26,000 for a family of three, and VLI units, defined as having rents affordable to households earning up to 50% of the area median income, or just under $43,000 for a family of three, now represent 25% of the overall housing plan. Updates to our extremely low and low affordability, otherwise known as ELLA, term sheet and our mix and match term sheets, which I will explain in more depth shortly, will help us to achieve this commitment to housing the lowest income New Yorkers. As part of the emphasis on ELI and VLI units, we also sought to address the homelessness crisis by improving the distribution of units for formerly homeless households. All ELLA and mix and match projects will include both homeless and ELI VLI units, ensuring that we are building both for current shelter residents and those who may be precariously housed. Second, we wanted the updated term sheets to assist in making projects more sustainable over the long term. HPD wants buildings to be financially healthy, not just at the point of construction, but throughout the life of the property. This helps to ensure good maintenance and that residents will have ongoing access to high quality housing. Incorporating ELI VLI units into projects that also have some slightly higher income units helps to do that. Third, in order to keep up with our ambitious production and preservation goals, we had to respond to the ever-changing marketplace. Our term sheets increased subsidy in part to address the concurrent reduction of resources and increases in cost. The affordable housing marketplace has not been immune to increased costs to develop property in New York City. Construction hard costs have risen approximately 15% since the start of Housing New York. The cost to develop is also increased by very high land costs, which are prevalent throughout the city. Finally, we updated the term sheets to improve our operations, create more clarity for developers who might not have much experience working with the city, and to codify common practices. Perhaps the most noteworthy and progressive of these clarifications relates to how the department is financing projects that are using HPD subsidy while also complying with the city's mandatory inclusionary housing program. As the committee knows, MIH was created as a baseline requirement for affordable housing and new developments where an increase in zoning allows for more residential floor area. The city explicitly did not intend to contribute funds that might subsidize MIH units, and so we had to establish a policy for affordable housing projects that go well beyond MIH affordability, but which are also subject to MIH requirements. Our new construction term sheets now clarify and codify that we expect developers to make an additional 15% of units permanently affordable on top of the 25 to 30% permanently affordable units required under MIH when HPD subsidy is provided. Now I will speak to the most significant programmatic changes to the term sheets. Mix and match now requires both homeless and ELI VLI units. Previously this was an option, but not a requirement. Ella has always emphasized deep affordability, but the current version of the term sheet creates a strong incentive to do both some homeless and some ELI VLI in the same project, rather than just a larger share of homeless units. In addition, requests for city subsidy that go above term sheet levels will require additional homeless units or additional permanent affordability going forward. We are also encouraging further incorporation of senior or supportive housing into predominantly family buildings. I'm also excited to say, share some of the changes in our Affordable Neighborhood Cooperative Program, or ANCP, term sheets. The ANCP program was launched in 2012 and rehabilitates former tenant interim lease program buildings into affordable home ownership as HDFC cooperatives. During a hearing for the Committee on Housing and Buildings this April, HPD announced a new approach to the TIL to ANCP conversion process that addressed the concerns brought by the council, residents, and the community. These collaborative efforts in conjunction with, the changing, with changing market conditions necessitated changes to the ANCP term sheet. HPD committed additional funding to rehabilitate these buildings and increased the maximum city subsidy from $110,000 to $200,000 per unit. The higher subsidy amount covers a greater share of the rehabilitation cost, reducing the amount of the private mortgage. This allows HPD to reduce the monthly maintenance payments in our ANCP units to be affordable for households earning 40% of area median income, or just about $34,000 per year for a family of three. 
Since the hearing, we are already seeing benefits to the ANC pipeline that will facilitate the development of affordable homeownership units. Updating our term sheets will result in a further diversification of New York's housing stock and drive deeper affordability. We know how important this is to the Council, and again thank Chair Williams, Chair Greenfield, Speaker Mark Viverito, and the many members who fought long and hard for even, fur for even further affordability in our projects. ELLA projects are now much more likely to lead to both homeless and ELI VLI units. Mix and match will now incentivize 40% ELI VLI units while requiring a minimum of 20% in, in any given project. Our partnership on this issue also recently resulted in the addition of $1.9 billion of capital funds over the remainder of Housing New York. This will be critical to implement the commitment of more housing for the lowest income households in our city. Thank you for the opportunity to testify, and we are happy to answer any questions you may have at this time. Thank you very much for the testimony. Um, I think there's a lot of good stuff happening uh, with the team term sheets which many of us uh, appreciate. I do want to delve uh, a little deeper in some of the things that were mentioned. Of course. Thank you for acknowledging the council and our effort uh, to push on this. Um, so my first question is, can you just tell us a little bit of how you to develop the term sheets? Do you consult with uh, advocates, affordable housing developers? And we know part of the frustration is a lot of it seems to happen, um, for lack of a better word, behind closed doors and not openly where people can comment. So can you tell us a little bit about this? Absolutely. Um, yes, it is a very uh, involved process that involves consulting with a lot of stakeholders. So on this particular iteration, we did a fair amount of analysis in-house to, to think about what our options were, but then we met with uh, the exec advisory boards of both Enterprise and LISC, which are, are housing intermediaries, their advisory boards are made up of a mixed group of nonprofit developers. We met with the NISAFA executive board. We met with a group of homeless advocates, including Picture the Homeless, Vocal, and Coalition for the Homeless. We met with a group of labor advocates. We met with the Supportive Housing Network of New York and some of their members. Uh, we had a very productive meeting with council land use and finance staff. We met with council members Greenfield and Salamanca, um, council members Cabrera, Cabrera and Gibson. Um, I, I know we were trying to connect with your office. I apologize that that did not happen. Um, and then we had a very productive and helpful conversation with a very large group of, of council staff people over the summer. Um, I think there were probably about 40 people there representing an array of different offices. Uh, so, no, I, I absolutely remember being re reached out to, and I think I actually saw the term sheet, so I'm, I'm, I feel comfortable. Gotcha. Um, but I did, but I know that some of that, I want to differentiate briefing versus consulting to actually develop the term sheets. So my understanding is some of those people that you mentioned, it was to brief them on what the term sheet was, and I'm trying to get an understanding of how many who did you speak to to develop the term sheet? How did the development? Sure. Um, the majority of those meetings that I just mentioned, with the exception of the brown bag after the fact, um, were before the, the term sheets were, result, were released. Um, part of the impetus for, for the changes were the feedback that we had gotten from uh, the first couple of years of using these. So these weren't, none of these were brand new products. We were starting, we were starting from, a term, from term sheets that had been in use. We had gotten lots of feedback, both from uh, those who were using them, and, but also from the council members who were reviewing projects in their district. Um, so when we started the process, we had a good sense of the feedback that we were going to get. Um, when we were, did all of these consultations in the pro time period leading up to the term sheet release, we did get some feedback um, and we certainly made changes. One, one piece, this is um, an example that, that particularly stuck in my head because it was such a good example of uh, us thinking about something in different ways than the advocate community was thinking about it, but we had, had have had in our term sheets for many, many years language that says priority given to projects that use less subsidy, um, which seems like a fairly straightforward and non-controversial piece of fiscal responsibility. But um, one of the advocate groups pointed out that it takes more subsidy to do the lower income units so that that could be misinterpreted. So we took out that language and we said we replaced it with, you know, priority given to projects that use less subsidy for a given AMI. Tier, um, which that was um, 
a simple change, it, uh, but, but I think it was useful feedback to get. <clears throat> so just for clarity, there was, in addition to what you said, there was no opportunity for open public discussion, correct? There was no kind of public hearing around the term sheets and the development of the term sheets. We don't do an open public hearing on the term sheets. Um, it's very important for us to have these be statements of policy rather than regulation or something that is, is codified. And there's a couple of reasons for that. First, um, it is useful to be nimble um, and to be able to make changes when we need to um, in response to really sensible feedback that we, that we get as we go along. Um, again, another example. Uh, it used to be that in Ella you could go to 20% moderate income units um, and in mix and match you could do 50% moderate and 50% low income. Um, but if you wanted to do a building that was 60% low income, we had no term sheet for you. Um, it was not allowed under our, our parameters. And that, you know, people came to us and said that didn't make a lot of sense. And as we thought about it, we agreed it didn't make a lot of sense. Um, there were communities where a 60% low income building is really exactly what we ought to be doing. So first of all, being nimble is important. The other thing is, I think the term sheet are documents that should work for 70 to 75% of projects. If we put out term sheets that work in absolutely every circumstance, we've been too generous. Um, but there are cases where being able to deviate from these terms makes a lot of sense. So if, for example, we have a project, a site that is um, running up against an MTA train line, the, the site conditions on that mean that it's going to be really expensive to build there, and it might mean that our HPD subsidy numbers that are in the term sheet aren't going to be enough. But if that is a blighted site, you know, sitting, vacant lot sitting in the middle of an otherwise thriving neighborhood, that could be a really good place to develop. So we, want to, we need to have the flexibility that we can deviate from the term sheet where we collectively agree that it makes sense. Does HPD take any measures after the properties are completed to ensure compliance with the term sheets? Absolutely. Um, virtually all of our projects, and particularly in the Ella and Mix and Match um, universe that we're talking about here, have low-income housing tax credits. Uh, and those have very strict penalties for, for compliance with the affordability restrictions. Um, so, and in fact, the, the investor the, who buys the low-income housing tax credits will lose their tax benefit if, if the uh, requirements, those affordability requirements aren't met. So it's not just HPD and, H and HDC, the Housing Development Corporation, that are looking at it, but also uh, the investor partner. So there is annual income certification. We review the results of that annual income certification. We do physical inspections. Um, so it's, it's a very intensive asset management process. Uh, you do, how often do you do the inspections? The physical inspections? Yeah. Um, it is... Uh, if it has a if the building has section eight in it, it's an annual inspection. I believe it is also an annual inspection for low income housing tax credits, although I want to confirm that and get back to you. Um, in, in other cases, it is on a periodic and as needed basis. Um, so just really quick, I want to make sure I go through all of the term sheets. So we have um, Ella is one term sheet. Yes. And mix and matches another. Correct. Um, ELI, VLI, not term sheets, just terminology within both of those. Correct. Are there any other term sheets? Uh, yes, there are many of them. I mean, um, go ahead. So we have within new construction, Ella and mix and match account for the bulk of the new construction, but we also have supportive housing and senior housing term sheets. We have uh, term sheets for the smaller projects. Um, it's called. The pro predominant small program is the Neighborhood Construction Program, NCP. This is for the, the little infill sites. We do some home ownership. Um, then on the preservation that. side, we have a, a host of programs because on our preservation programs, the term sheets range from doing fairly small scale systems work, right? There is a term, the housing rehabilitation program is if an owner needs some help uh, replacing the boiler, replacing the roof, all the way up through the gut rehab programs and, and a lot of things in between. So these are all up on our website. Um, we're happy to get you a list of all of the different programs if that would be useful. Um, did you submit that to us? The PowerPoint? Yes. Um, did we? Yes. Okay. 
And so just to go point by point, just repeat again the Ella term sheets, please, the, Emma, the terms in the Ella. Um, so the, the principal terms, and the, the term sheet itself is, is about six pages, so I won't read the whole thing, but there are two, two primary options for mixing the affordability. Um, option one is 10% homeless and then a mix of units going at 30, 40, 50% of AMI, and, uh, up to 60. Option two is 30% homeless um, and then a smaller tier at the 40 and 50% AMI. Um, and when I talked in my testimony about um, emphasizing in, in Ella both the extremely low, VL, the ELI, VLI units and the homeless, um, under Sorry, is it homeless is separate than VLI? So you have uh, yes. ELI, VLI, and homeless. And homeless. Um, in the previous iteration of the ELA term sheet, uh, we gave a lot more subsidy for the homeless units than we did for the ELI, VLI units. Um, and so this, there was a very strong financial incentive to do the 30% homeless and not to do those not to do the 30% AMI units. Um, so homelessness is a very important need. Uh, I think it's, it's good that we were building homeless units, but we were concerned that we weren't also building units for extremely low income households who were precariously housed. So the, term, the critical change that we made to the ELLA term sheet was that we changed the subsidy numbers so you no longer have this really significant financial incentive to do just the homeless and not the 30% AMI units. Um, so just for clarity, in the ELLA, how, what percentage is all of this inclu of, include of the units, the, the universe of units? Is, uh, what percentage is that? So is it 70, 30, 60, 40? You're saying 10% has to be homeless. So there, there's two options within yeah. ELLA. 10% are homeless. Yeah. This isn't, sorry, this is an option one. 10% are homeless. 10% or 30% AMI, 10% or 40% AMI, 10% or 50% AMI. Um, so that gets, that's the first 40% of the building. Okay. Um, the remaining units are up to 60% of AMI, but you can also, unless you opt to do a tier that can go up to, to moderate income. So, um, it is, you can do a ceiling of 30% of the units that go up to 100% of AMI. Okay. So it is a minimum of 70%, 60% uh, or below with those subcategories that I spelled out. A minimum of? A minimum of 70% at 60% AMI or below, but, but the, with those subcategories. Um, but some of the projects might be 80% at 60% AMI or below or, or 100%. This and the others you can go up to 100% of AMI. The, right, for the moderate incomes you can go up, moderate income units you can go to 100%. Option two within ELLA, 30% mm -hmm. um, of the units are for formerly homeless, 5% are at 40% AMI, 5% are at 50% of AMI. You also have that option. I'm sorry, 30% are for, formerly homeless, 5% right. are at 40% AMI? Yep, 5% okay. are at 50 um, up to 30% go up to 100% AMI, and then everything else is at or below 60. And this is just the developer can choose which option? Yes, although we will steer that process fairly significantly. We will look at what exists in the neighborhood, what has been built there recently, um, where we think the holes in the market are, what the community, what the uh, local electeds in the community board are interested in seeing. So it is an iterative process um, and, and the developer gets a lot of input from us and other stakeholders on that. Um, and the majority of our projects under the old version of the ELLA term sheet were in option two because of the way the financing was structured. Um, so you weren't getting the 30% AMI units. I think now the majority of, we, we are, it is now actually a much more financially realistic option to do option one, and we're gonna see those 30% AMI units that are for uh, non-homeless households, which I think is a, a terrific ad. 
And the breakdown for the mix and match? Uh, mix and match is a lot more, um, it allows for more creativity. We have a menu of different options of AMI numbers, and there is, um, there is more opportunity to, um, at, at the risk of sort of belaboring it, mix and match. So at least 40% of the units have to be at or below 60. Um, and no more than 60% of the units can be at or below 60. Say that again. At least 40%. Right, but of no the more unit. than 60. So you have, four, it is 40 to 60% low income. Within that low income tier, 10%. How do you say, okay, I just want to follow you. It's at at least 40% of the units mm -hmm. are at or below 60%. Six, yep. And you said it's at least, why do you say 40 to 60%? Uh, 60, no more than 60% of the building can be at or below 60% of AMI within mix and match. Um, within that low income tier, whether in that 40 to 60% of the units, 10% must be homeless and 10% must be extremely low, very low income. Uh, the way the subsidy structure is set up you get, the developers get significantly more subsidy for doing the extremely low and very low income units. So uh, although we have set minimums, we actually think that we are underwriting most projects so that it'll go beyond the minimum. And so what triggers the use of these term sheets are uh, direct subsidy from the city? Correct. I do have a philosophical question. Why don't we consider the rezoning's a direct subsidy from the city. Why does it have to be a dush additional funding? If, 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 a, if a developer is rezoning a community, they are getting something from the city which could be viewed as a direct subsidy. So why doesn't that not trigger automatically? Right. The uh, rezoning, the MIH program, is designed to be a market-driven program that where the, the benefit that they're getting is the added added density, it's a real benefit, but it is a real benefit that supports some affordability, but not nearly the depth of affordability that actual capital subsidy will support. I'm, I'm still not clear. Okay. Why, why, why can we not consider that a subsidy that triggers these type of term sheets or something similar? The, the, in order to make sure that the projects are financially viable because we are a portion of the of the um, sources of the development costs but certainly not the entire piece of it and and in an MIH project we are not part of the cost of the project at all generally right we are not covering the, the construction costs of that project um, there needs to be sufficient revenue coming from that project to cover the costs of the development. Uh, the, the added density offsets, a, adds revenue to the project because there's more units and that allows us to purchase some affordability, but we would have to put in subsidy to be able to purchase as much affordability as we're able to get through the term sheets. There are, where we can purchase more affordability, we absolutely do. We have done some projects that overlay MIH and the HPD subsidy programs that are the term sheets, and in that case, it is absolutely the deeper requirements that are on the term sheet that are what is the governing set of regulations. All right, I have additional questions on this and some other sure. things, but, uh, but I want to get to my colleagues. And so, Councilmember Salamanca and Grodenchik uh, both have questions. This is no council members, I'm going to try to be lenient and not use the clock, but uh, if everyone can kind of be responsive with it, that would be helpful. Thank you, Mr. Right. Chair. Councilman Solomon. Thank you. Good morning, uh, Commissioner. Good morning. Um, Commissioner, um, my first question is, who exactly decides on how the term sheets are changed? Who in HPD makes these decisions? Um, so this was, it, it was a, a process that involved the development team that is under me, but it was reviewed by the commissioner, I, they were reviewed by our general counsel, they were reviewed by um, our budget team, there, there were a lot of players within HPD involved as well as the various parties that I mentioned who are external 
um, and City Hall signed off on them as well. Okay. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the uh, Our Space program, which the name has changed now to the Homeless Set Aside. Uh, just to get clarification, there is a 10%, there's a mandatory 10% for both Mix and Match and Ella? Correct. So regardless of where there's a project, it could be in the Upper East Side, up in Riverdale, if they're getting city subsidies, there has to be a 10% set aside in, this, in these projects. Correct. And there is no, no, I want 8%, I want 5%. It is 10%. Correct. Okay. I want to thank you for that. Uh, one of the issues that I saw in my communities, as I saw developers come in, they wanted to always uh, apply for the, um, the hour space program, at times even offering 30%. Um, you know, and in my communities, the issues that I had with this project or with the, the way the, the fact sheet was set at the time was that the hour space units were taken away from my 30% AMI units. And I know that uh, after multiple conversations with HPD to see that you came back with new fact sheets where you are, there is a set aside, regardless of what community it is, they have to um, take in a 10% homeless set aside, uh, but also we're protecting the 30% AMI units, uh, the low income units. So uh, I thank you for that. Thank you for all your input, we appreciate it. Now, my other question is, in terms of the homeless set aside, how is HPD ensuring that homeless families are coming back to their communities with these units that are set aside? So the homeless referrals come from DHS to HPD. Uh, there are generally the practice is that there are up to three referrals for every homeless unit. Uh, we do that to make sure that there is, uh, both the homeless families have an opportunity to have some level of selection, that we are keeping the process moving, that you know, things happen, people don't come to interviews, it, um, so, so we do that. Defining where a homeless household comes from is actually a challenging concept. Um, a family may have been in a shelter in a given neighborhood for a year, a year and a half. Their kids are in school in that neighborhood. They have put down some roots. Prior to entering into shelter, most families don't go directly from a given address into the shelter system. They spend a period of time you know, sleeping on their mother's couch or staying with a friend. They often bounce around a little bit. So that sort of what is the community of origin is actually a challenging question to answer. What we have found that the, the most successful predictor of a family's stability is whether or not they, we are able to match their borough of preference um, for where they are moving. So if a family indicates that they want to live in the Bronx and we are able to match them to a unit in the Bronx or they want to live in Brooklyn and we're able to match them to a unit in Brooklyn, they are much more likely to remain housed stably housed than if we say, hey, guess what? We got something for you in Queens. So there's no indicators other than families choosing where they want to move uh, in terms of homeless families other than bringing families back to where their children are going to school at or where their friends or families are at? We, we, where we can, we certainly look to make sure that we are helping those homeless families remain connected to whatever social infrastructure that they have, things like schools, doctors, hospitals, churches. And HPD works with DHS on this, and who makes the final decision as to who, who enters that unit? Is it HPD or is it DHS? Uh, DHS is, is referring the three households for any given unit. The developer is actually doing that, that final screening process the way that they do for any of the units that are going through the lottery with significant HPD oversight to make sure that there is um, nothing untoward going on. Who gives on. the final okay? HPD. Okay, awesome. Um, and then finally, uh, just a question in terms of your financing fund that you have. Uh, with the new uh, fact sheets, you've increased subsidies for units from one hundred and ten to two hundred thousand uh, dollars per unit. How is this going to affect your, uh, your your financing fund that you have for future projects with the increase? Right. 
so that specific change was the ANCP, just to, to make sure we're all on the same page. Um, because the, the mayor added almost $2 billion to HPD's capital budget in the executive plan to serve extremely low and very low income families, um, that 40% uh, AMI households that, that we are underwriting to within the ANCP program qualify as, as towards that uh, extremely low and very low income set aside and we'll be using those funds to do it. Um, I feel very privileged that we have a capital budget of about a billion dollars a year uh, and we are optimistic that that will be sufficient to get through our, our Housing New York plan. Thank you. And once again, I congratulate you on making it a requirement, regardless of what community in the city of New York, that if they are getting city subsidies, they too have to participate in the Homeless Set Aside uh, program. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Dunton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good morning. Still good morning. morning? I think it's, yeah, it's still morning. Um, you mentioned a billion. I just want to pick up on some of the things that my colleague, uh, uh, Mr. Salamanca, mm -hmm. said. Um, we're looking at about a billion dollars a year in subsidies across the city. Is that what you're telling me? Our capital plan is about a billion dollars a year, correct. And that at 200, the maximum, good morning, Adonis. The maximum is 200,000 per unit? So it could be less, that's all I'm getting at. Uh, so. Absolutely, the, that 200,000 is specifically for the ANCP program, which while a critically important piece of Housing New York because it is a home ownership program for, for very low income households is a fairly small piece of the overall Housing New York numbers. So do you have a number on what the average subsidy per unit to create affordable housing is? Uh, within new construction programs, the, uh, it averages um, about $150,000 a year, I would 150? say. Yep. Okay. Um, preservation projects range tremendously because we are within the rubric of preservation we're talking everything from replacing a boiler through gut rehab so it's a much harder question to answer and what is the average number of people per unit is it three is it four is it two and a half is it it's about two and a half okay and on on the homeless stuff um, on the on the people that are coming in that DA, DHS is recommending all these folks they're yes, screening, all, them, they're all screening them for you? Correct. Because one of the complaints that I get, and I'm sure all of my colleagues get, is that, you know, we just don't, certainly don't have enough affordable housing. And I know how hard you're working. But I was curious, I think you've pretty much explained it to my satisfaction, um, where the recommendations are coming from. And um, are you successful generally in keeping people? I know it, it's, you know, like a, a district like mine where we have you know, no affordable units being created or very, very few, um, it would be hard. But uh, I, I expect um, that you're fairly decent at matching people to their districts. Um, so there, there's two separate pathways here. The homeless units are coming, um, the referrals are coming through DHS. Uh, as I mentioned, we are looking to wherever possible to match the homeless families to their borough of preference. Um, for the units that are going, the non-homeless units that are going through the, our lottery process, uh, Housing Connect, uh, right now 50% of those units are set aside for community, residents of the community board. Um, there's some litigation going on there and I won't I comment on that further. <laughs> I've read. Okay. I appreciate that and I thank you for your work. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you. We've also been joined by Council Member. Rodriguez, just um, back to the the MIH discussion. So, so for Ella and Mix and Match, there are no market rate units. Is that correct? Correct. And you're saying for MIH, you need the market rate units, I guess, to cross subsidize. MIH is, sorry, excuse me. An MAH project that has no other HPD involvement, right? There, we're not putting capital subsidy into it all, is essentially a market rate project. We I just, I just, the only thing I want to say is I believe the rezoning itself is a subsidy. I just want to make sure I'm clear on that. Right. And we agree with you, and that's how we're able to leverage the 25 to 30 percent affordable, but to go deeper and, and broader than that would need the capital piece to go along with it. 
why, why can we mandate a certain amount of affordability in the MIH similar to what we're doing with the term sheets? Let me make sure that I, I'm, I hope I'm answering the right question, but we do mandate the affordability within MIH. So we have the four different options. Uh, so ranging from you know, option one is. So let me clarify, because sorry. these mix and match mandates a certain amount of homeless, uh, and it looks like it may mandate a certain amount of low income, like 30 or 40 percent. Why can we mandate a certain amount of homeless units in all of the options in MIH, or minimally mandate a certain amount of 40 percent AMI in all of the options in MIH? Uh, so we have, we have 40 percent units in option one, as you know. Um, and it, it really depends on the market that the units are in, and that's why MIH was based on a very carefully researched market study um, that took into account what the rents are in a given, the market rents are in a given neighborhood and how much revenue that those were going to generate and therefore how much affordability and how deep the affordability could be um, to offset those, the affordable units. The homeless units that we're underwriting, we underwrite those at shelter rent. So the, the tenants at those are paying, you know, a couple of hundred dollars a month for their unit. It is a terrific thing that we are able to do that, but it is an expensive proposition. Um, we put a lot of subsidy into the units that are underwritten at shelter rent, and the, frankly, the, the MIH, the zoning is a real benefit to the developer, but it is not a deep enough benefit to cross-subsidize those, the homeless units. Sure. Uh, my understanding was the sweet spot to help cross-subsidize and allow a unit to maintain itself was 40 percent of AMI. So why didn't we mandate a specific percentage of 40 percent of AMI in every option in MIH? Across the, the diversity of neighborhoods within New York City, market rents obviously vary tremendously. So there are absolutely places where that 40 percent number works, but there are also places where the 40 percent number doesn't work because the market rents are relatively lower. So just for clarity, you think the, the three options that don't use or don't mandate 40 percent AMI could not have handled a mandated 5 percent of 40 percent or 10 percent of 40 percent? Um, so just to clarify that there are two options that don't include 40 percent AMI, sure. I think okay. two of them do. Um, MIH was a very carefully negotiated set of policies. It was the product of a market study that looked very carefully at market conditions across different neighborhoods. Um, it went through a full ULERP. It, it was passed by the council. We are extremely proud of the progressive framework that we uh, worked together with the council to create through mandatory inclusionary, but we really think that the best way to get to more extremely low and very low income units is to focus on what we can do with our term sheets. I, I hear you. Uh, I voted against MIH. I think it was wrong. I think most people believe that we could have done no, more now. And I was going to say retrospect, but I think people believed it then. They just didn't do it. Um, but I do want to specify the question. Are you saying that the two options that don't use, uh, don't mandate 40 percent of AMI, the market in parts of the city could not have handled a mandate of 5 percent of 40 percent AMI or 10 percent of 40 percent AMI? In, I, at this point, I'm speaking based on my experience uh, in, in housing policy. Um, I think in order to get to the 40 percent AMI units in some of those markets, we would have had to give up some of the other tiers of affordability, so we would have ended up with fewer affordable units, although deeper affordable units, and given the discussion and the trade-off and the very comprehensive vetting process that this went through, the uh, emphasis on having the range of incomes as opposed to smaller numbers of units at a deeper affordability level was what made most sense for the city. All right. So, yes, we could have handled a mandate. We would have had to have a trade-off on affordable units. We have a very, uh, there's a very broad definition of what affordable is. Uh, I just submit, as I did back then, 
I think some of that trade-off would have been beneficial. I believe in a broad spectrum of income bands. I also believe in projects that have market rate. I like, I don't want segregated pockets of poverty in the city. Uh, but uh, I want to say that I think that trade-off would have been beneficial because we still would have had units in those other MIs, albeit less of it, but we would have had deeper affordability mandated to break up the segregated pockets of poverty, which everyone knew we should have done, for some reason didn't. I'm happy that we're doing the term sheets now to try to make up some of that. But uh, going forward, I think we need to think of this more thoroughly. My hope is actually we review MIH and change it because, uh, there, as you have mentioned, there are all ways to do it. We just have to decide what our priority is. And it seemed that our priority was not going deeper into affordability, which I think was a mistake. And I think most people believe that we should have. I won't force you to respond to that. You can if you, will, if you want to, but I won't try to force you. you to respond to that. But, um, I do have a question. Um, are, are we going to review the amount of units that are being asked for in the mayor's housing plan? I know that we are achieving the goals in some places, um, going past the goals, which is great, but many folks believe that the amount of units and the goals over there were not enough to begin with. So with this new term sheets, are we going to look at the housing plan? In what ways are we going to look at the housing plan to make changes? And are we going to increase some of the goals? Uh, we remain committed absolutely to the 200,000 units, and we'll always look for ways that we can go beyond it, but the, the bottom line number of 200,000 remains the same. Um, the critical change that we made was shifting 10,000 of those 200 down to the extremely low and very low income units. So the, of the plan, it is now 25% extremely low and very low income, um, where it was 20% previously. Uh, we can flip to that slide again. So, um, which was great, and I, I give a lot of kudos for that 10,000 shift when it happened, but we now have 21% of very low and extremely low, is that correct? Uh, it is a 21% increase on the very low income and a 31% increase on the very low. The total percentage overall is that of the plan is that 25, the target is 25% combined ELI, VLI. 25%? Of, yes. Com so VLI, ELI will be combined 25%. Correct. Um, so we have a chart here that says most of the population is almost at, looks like 30, let's do the math here. 40, about 41% very low and um, VLI and ELI. Most of the population is at 41%, uh, but our goals here are at 25%. So first of all, I would say that these construction numbers are a part of the housing solution. I'm this is just for construction? Th this is the, uh, this is construction meeting, new construction and preservation. But, but development, housing, the Housing New York plan is a part of the response to serving extremely low and very low income households in New York. Uh, rental subsidies are another really important piece of that puzzle, and, and public housing is another really important piece of that puzzle, and I think investing in, in public housing maintenance and, and making sure that that remains a solid piece of the housing stock, which is not my department, but is something that the administration has, has done a lot, uh, made major steps towards as well. So first I would say that there are multiple ways to serve housing needs of the lowest income New Yorkers. So Second, why is that not part of the housing plan? The public housing piece of it? Well, all the things that you mentioned, why is that not part of the broader housing plan? Uh, so Housing New York has the 200,000 unit goal that gets a lot of attention because it is very easy to put in a press release, but it is, there's also a lot of other things that are in Housing New York and actually investment in public housing and attention to rental subsidies and many other ASP policy goals are in fact part of Housing New York. Um, so the Housing New York plan, you're saying uh, 200,000 units preserved or created is not the whole thing. So how many units does the Housing New York hope to develop or preserve? 200,000 units uh, created and preserved are associated with Housing New York, but there are a number of policy initiatives that are not tied to direct unit counts that are, that are really important components of the Housing New York plan. Uh, I would also say that 
you know, we do not count anything related to NYCHA uh, preservation in the Housing New York plan, so there was a, a major recapitalization and rehabilitation of, of a project that was started in December of 2016 that NYCHA did. Um, HPD wasn't involved in it other than, than supporting it with a property tax exemption, but uh, that was a critical housing preservation of permanently affordable units. It's not, it is above and beyond what we are counting towards the housing plan. The frustration is, but so now we have a housing crisis. We have a homelessness plan that's under one commissioner and one deputy mayor. We have a housing plan that's under one commissioner and one deputy mayor. And now we have NYCHA. That is three different pieces, and that is very frustrating. And so the one thing that we have to look at is Housing New York, which I would assume, if it's coming from the administration, would encapsulate all that is being done around housing. You're saying that that's not the case. I do need to focus on that, and my question is, according to the Housing New York plan, 25 percent of the units are for very low and extremely low, but the population is at 41 percent. So. First, you know, as we were just talking about, there are a variety of ways to serve extremely low and very low income households that are uh, on top of what we would count to the unit starts in Housing New York. Second, there are real drivers of housing need other than income. So one of the things that we see from the households that are coming in and applying for HPD housing is they may be living doubled up with other households, they may be living in very poor conditions, uh, they may be living very far from jobs so that that is, is limiting their social and economic mobility. So there are a variety of reasons that a household might need affordable housing that actually I think are very legitimate and so we are trying to address a spectrum of those. Um, and there actually I think it was ANHD had a report that really focused on, I wish it had got more attention actually, focused on overcrowding because of overcrowding numbers I don't think are factored in to the homelessness crisis the way they should be which means the numbers would be I think a lot higher. Most of what you said, except for um, where the person lives, which actually I would include that. I would, most of those probably are also associated with income. If the income was higher, you'd probably be able to afford not to be doubled or tripled up or afford to live closer to the job. Although it may not push you down to the uh, income, the lower income, it probably is a connected to. They are certainly income. related, yes. Um, but I just want to be clear are you saying that? the numbers that are in Housing New York are satisfactory goals to be reaching? We always strive to do more. Uh, at this point, about a third of the units that we have actually started so far are for extremely low and very low income units, and I'm even more proud of the fact that in 2017, in the fiscal year that ended in June, uh, more like 40 percent of the units were extremely low and very low income units. Uh, it is. It is a, a goal that we always look to over ex to exceed, um, but we also understand that there are a variety of competing factors. Um, one of, we are very sensitive, for example, to low-income housing tax credit raises. Uh, a, Low-income housing tax credit is a major source of funding for affordable housing, and, and simply the threat of federal tax reform has driven those raises down substantially, so we are managing our way through that. Um, so absolutely, we will look to exceed the goals if we possibly can, but understanding that we exist in a larger marketplace. Um, I have some more questions. I know you're probably happy about that. But uh, absolutely. Uh, I do want to go to my colleague. I, I also want to just be, clarify that um, I believe the percentages are wrong, and the amount of units we're trying to build as an aggregate number are wrong in the um, housing plan. I thought it was a good framework. And I'm actually happy we're achieving the goals, but we do have to review. Just like I think we should be reviewing MIH, I think people finally agreed that we should be reviewing the term sheets and dig deeper. We did agree to review the, the, the housing plan by going deeper and adding those 10,000, so I think all those are good. But we got to keep pushing because uh, the, the crisis is not getting better, even with the great work that is being done. So we got to figure out why and where, and I think some of that starts with the goals we're trying to achieve. I understand sometimes you want to set a goal so you can achieve more of it. It looks really good. Uh, I, here I'd be into 
setting a, a large goal, maybe not achieving it, but at least we're, we're reaching for it. And I don't think that we're reaching for it now. I do have some additional questions, and I'm going to go to my colleague, Councilmember Rodriguez. Um, because of the limited amount of council members, I did not set a time clock and asking the council members to please use it uh, responsibly. So far, the two council members have. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, and thank you for your leadership advocating for, you know, our tenants and be sure that we build affordable housing for working class and middle class. You know, Inwood is one of those areas that we are looking to create the best condition to build affordable housing. And by the way, yes, this evening, today we are, you know, starting the new phases of that vision for Inwood with a scoping meeting that we will have tonight. Where we, were he where we were here from members of the community, what is that we would like to see happening after we rezone that area? Uh, something that in principle, in general, I will be working with this administration to get it done, assuming that we are able to finalize probably by this time next year and be able to vote on the rezoning of Inward and hoping to build, to create a condition to build thousand uh, new units affordable for working class and middle class. And I do believe that it is important to build housing not only for our working class, but also for our working class New Yorkers. And I do believe it is important to have different tier where a percentage should be designated for those individuals that make the average income in areas such as in mine where it's around $36,000, as also to build a percentage of those apartments for the teacher and the firefighter, the son and daughter of those working class family, who many of them live with the poverty line, but their son and daughter, they are doing better. One area where I have concern is about those individuals that the average income is not even close to the average median income. Like, what will happen to those families? Let's say my mother is lucky because we are many son and daughter, but she's been relying on her SSI. So what is the plan that we have in our city? In those areas, let's say, such as in England, where we have the largest regulated apartments in the city of New York, and the second ones in the state of the Buffalo. So when we will be approaching, you know, getting close to a agreeing on whatever is going to be the best rezoning that we will do, how will we protect, like, that percentage? Not those who average income is $36,000 or twenty-five. Yet the other percentage who make 15000 those who rely on SSI, that they will not qualify to fill out the, the application to be part of the lottery process. So do, will we have Section 8? Will we have other programs? Will we let you know, that percentage of New Yorker to be able to apply for the affordable housing, even though their income is not at the level of the average median income of those of our communities? Right. Um, so first, let me say I'm very interested and committed to the Inwood rezoning, both as, as my professional capacity, but also as one of your constituents, so thank you. Um, serving that range of, of incomes and getting down below 30, there's, there are some real challenges there, um, but I think we are actively looking at different ways that we can do that, and I think the senior housing that we're doing is a really good example of that. Um, Virtually all of the senior housing that we are doing uses project-based Section 8 contracts. Um, so the federal government essentially pays, 30, pays the bulk of the rent on those units. The tenant pays 30% of whatever their income is, but it does allow us to serve senior citizens who we are aware, based on all of the demographic data that exists, that you know, senior citizens' incomes are very, very, very low. So that is why we have structured the, the seniors program to generally rely on project-based vouchers. Um, serving that population for, for families is 
a little bit more challenging, but we are doing uh, tiers of project-based voucher units within some of our other buildings um, and looking for other creative ways that we can do it. Um, so it's something that we continue to look at. I, I think it is important to put the clarity now because I spent my first time here as a council, my first four years, where we hear a lot. We will look at it. This is a challenge that we know that we have in front of us. And in my community, for the 12 years of the previous administration, only two, around 200 affordable housing were built in 12 years. So at the same time that we saw a lot of backlanders pushing people out, we are the city well not building. Right. And what brought me to support, in general, the concept of rezoning inward is because I do believe that we have a plan to rezone that community in the area, that beside the percentage of apartment that will be market, that we will be able also to bring the older percentage for the working class and middle class. One of them is gonna be the public library. Yeah. We're gonna be building a new library uh, and, and housing above the library. Right. So I know that that one's gonna be 100% affordable, but it is critical. You know, because we talk about the average median income, the percentage of people who are on employment, and the number that we share sometimes at Manhattan level or borough level is not necessarily a description for the whole borough. Let's say in Inwood, to the east of Broadway, where the rezoning will be focusing, that particular average income, I'm pretty sure that when we studied that data, a good percentage income is probably like $20,000, $18,000. So it is important as we are gonna be, you know, moving forward, starting this new conversation, the new phases, not only for Inwood, but for the whole city, that we not only say we have challenges, we're gonna be looking at this, but what will we do with that percentage of families that the average income is fifteen, eighteen thousand dollars $18,000? I support, again, I support a percentage for the average median income. I support a percentage for the middle class, but we also have that group in that universe. So, I. Un understood. It it costs about $7,000 a unit a year to keep the lights on, to pay the super salary, to have the insurance, the sort of very basic operating costs. Um, so there are many households that aren't gonna be able to afford that rent level. Uh, we've been able to get down to the 30% AMI level using a variety of capital subsidy and cross subsidization options to get much below 30% of the area median income, we're generally gonna need a rent subsidy. Uh, we are using Section 8 to the best of our ability and I very much hope that that will continue to be a, a stream of subsidy that remains available. We are working, keeping a very close eye on what's going on in the federal level to make sure that that is the case. Um, but then we also have a variety of city rent subsidies that we are leveraging wherever we can to make sure that we can serve the, uh, the full complement of incomes. Okay. Please, I end it with this. Please, you know, pay attention to that percentage. And I end, you know, I will be working with this administration to get the rezoning of Inwood if we are able, again, to build housing for working class and middle class too knowing that percentage will be marked as also a good percentage to be affordable. But I think that that percentage of New Yorkers who average income is too low, even to qualify in the new termship, it is important for us to pay attention to that group. Understood. Thank you. Thank you, you Councilman. Uh, I do have a, a couple more questions. And then I, I actually want to ask a couple of questions from the advocates who are submitting a testimony, because I just want to uh, hear a response. Um, just back to the MIH uh, briefly. So um, when, if they choose an option and, and they choose mix and match or Ella and they overlay, the terms of Ella and mix and match are then applied? Absolutely. The other thing that we have done in this iteration of the term sheets is if it is an MIH project that is using HPD subsidy, it has to comply with all of the term sheet requirements, but we also require that 15% additional units need to be permanently affordable. So the MIH requirement is that... What's the definition of permanent? Um, till the building comes down. 
Okay. <laughs> um, and just back to, uh, I think we were talking about how you get to the term sheets and we were saying there was no public hearing. Just explain to again why the thought process is if there's a policy and, and programmatic, there wouldn't be uh, opportunity for the public to weigh in? So we need, it is important that we are able to be flexible and adaptable with our term sheets, which is why we don't put them in formal regulation and go through a CAPA process, anything like that. Um, we need to be able to adapt to changing market conditions. Uh, we get, often, we get feedback from, from elected officials, from communities, from developers of things that make a lot of sense and, and it is useful to be able to have a fairly straightforward um, process for making changes. This was a major overhaul. We did a lot of vetting this time around, but occasionally we'll make more minor tweaks. And then there are projects that for a whole variety of reasons it may make sense to do even if they don't comply with a particular set of term sheet requirements. Um, so uh, trying to, to think of a good example. Um, and the one that I used before that I, I think remains a good example is the site is particularly expensive to build because it's up against a train line. Still a good project to do, um, but it's going to need more subsidy than we spelled out in our term sheet. If it was, if the term sheets were codified in regulation, um, we wouldn't be able to have that level of flexibility, whereas as statements of policy, we do have that flexibility. Now, that part I get. I think I can argue a little bit even for a little more codification, but that part I got, I was trying to figure out why even the, the policy we couldn't have uh, or would not have some sort of hearing around such major changes in policy. Um, we take feedback on a continual basis from the people who work with the term sheets, and I'm using work with in a very broad perspective, the people who, you know, the communities who are, and elected officials who are voting on projects, the developers, uh, tenant and advocacy groups. The bulk of what is in the term sheets are highly technical housing finance terms. We're covering the allowable loan to value and debt service coverage ratios and, uh, you know, what the equity requirement is. And, and um, to be frank, we didn't see it as, as topics for generalized public but uh, input, but we certainly take comments on an ongoing basis. Uh, we welcome this forum. We, and as I said at the beginning, we heard from, I don't know, probably 150 different stakeholders on the, at the end of the day on input into the term sheets and took their comments very seriously. Okay, and, and back to the housing plan. These new term sheets, are they gonna increase the amount of um, ELI and VLI or is this to achieve the 10,000 that we put on before? It is to achieve the increase that was announced in the mayor's state of the city. Ah. This, this is the implementation plan for what the, for what the mayor announced. Are, gonna, are we going to be reviewing the plan to either increase the aggregate number or increase the VLI, ALI? We are always happy to have conversations about that, absolutely. I don't know if that was a yes, no, or maybe. Which one is that? I I would say I think we're we're constantly reevaluating the goals of the plan and and the. Um, that sounds like a longer version of what she said. Fair enough. <laughs> okay, it sounds like there's no real answer. My my push is that we do need to look at um, relook at the the housing plan and make some uh, some some adjustments. Same way I feel for MIH. I do want to uh, talk about some of the questions I heard advocates asking. Um, this has to do with Ella option one. Uh, the difference in the subsidy per unit of the old Ella and new Ella approaches double compared to the relatively small difference between the deep AMI homelessness units of the old Ella and new Ella. Basically saying that the amount of subsidy we're giving, we're not getting enough back. So do you have any response to that? Absolutely. 
Um, under old Ella, and we had essentially the same distribution of units as, as is pointed out, um, but on top of the $75,000 in subsidy per unit that was part of the base term sheet, you could get an additional up to $150,000 a unit for the, um, for the homeless units under the R space sort of overlay. Um, so it wasn't included in the term sheet, it was sort of a separate funding stream for homeless units. So for a homeless unit, you got uh, $225,000. That meant that the incentive was absolutely to go with option two, right? Because for 30% of the units, you got $225,000, whereas for option one, you got, uh, you got that 225 just for your 10% of the units and everything else, you got the lower subsidy number. So the result that we saw, and this was a very unintended consequence, but was that there was a strong incentive and many more of the projects were going with option two. Um, homeless units are certainly desperately needed, but we did not want to create a competition between the homeless units and the 30% AMI units. So by evening out the subsidy numbers between option one and option two, we actually think that we're going to get actually achieve more of those 30% AMI units. So the change was to try to steer people to use a different, uh, they were steering toward one unit, and so now you want to try to uh, incentivize them to use other options, is that correct? Correct, and I should also point out that there were some real increases in costs from the point at which uh, the original ELLA term sheet was released. We've seen about a 15% increase in cost since the start of Housing New York. That's a uh, New York City construction market, not Housing New York specific, but it's a reality of life that we have to deal with. All right, there's um, similar questions both from ANHD and tenants and neighbors. So I'm just going to read some of the tenants and neighbors' testimony. Um, third, there's a significant concern that a developer using the mix and match term sheet could pick four income bands where one is the 10% homeless required, one is 10% between 30 50% AMI required, but the other 80% of the units could all be unaffordable to our communities, 70% to 130% bands. Do you want to make any? Yep, that's a, I think, misreading of the term sheet, and we can certainly look at the language and see if, if it needs to be clarified. Under mix and match, a minimum of 40% of the units have to be in the low income space, so that means 60% AMI or below. Um, the other thing that I would to add onto that is that the, the subsidy numbers are structured uh, to incentivize that it goes uh, substantially further. So if you were doing a 30% AMI unit within mix and match, the subsidy number for that is $185,000. If you're doing a 60% AMI unit, you're getting $95,000. So there is a real meaningful financial incentive to do those lower income units. So we are setting some baseline requirements. Um, Term sheets are statements of policy that need to work citywide, so we try to balance the requirements versus with, with some level of flexibility. So there are baseline requirements, but there are also incentives to go significantly beyond that. And both had um, similar questions. I'm just going to read a couple, and then you can respond. Why the greater subsidy levels for buildings with more higher AMI units? Why is the new ELA structured? so that buildings with more high AMI units get greater subsidy over scenarios with deeper affordability. And here is the term sheets outline that HPD give preferences to developers who use the least amount of subsidies. We believe that despite the large subsidies that should provide incentives for developers to select the lowest income bands, the conflicting message of a least subsidy will direct developers seeking to win an RFP to select higher income bands that are incompatible with neighborhood and citywide need. Um, all right, so first let me answer the question about the ELLA and the, the projects with the up to 30% moderate income tier. Um, anything at or below 60% AMI is eligible for low income housing tax credits. That is an incredibly valuable source of financing for a project. Um, on average, this is a very rough average because projects vary, but uh, housing ta tax credit units are getting about $125,000 a unit in equity. So if you do 60, if your unit is at 60% AMI, you can generate that equity through the low income housing tax credits and that really offsets need for subsidy. 
If the unit is at 70% AMI, you get zero. There's no sliding scale or anything like that. It is, it is you are in the tax credit bucket or you out of the low income housing tax credit bucket. So the moderate income units generate no low income housing tax credit equity. So there is um, a hole there that exists in the financing structure for those projects that, that needs to be dealt with. The reason that we want to have those units and, and why we really thought very carefully about these numbers and structured it this way is that um, the comment that I made during my testimony, we didn't talk a lot about it, but is the need to make sure that the buildings are sustainable. Um, we, we can subsidize the capital cost up front, but we also need to make sure that over that 30, 40, 50 year lifetime of the, of the affordability period, even longer in a lot of cases, that the maintenance is getting done, that the you know, front lighting is good, all of the things that we want to make sure that those are high quality affordable housing assets. And the, the sort of sweet spot for the average income for the building to be able to cover the, those basic maintenance costs is right in about the 55, 60% AMI, right? 50 to 60% AMI. So we have two choices. We can either make all of the units in that 50, 60% AMI unit and it'll cover the operating costs, or we can do some of the units much deeper and have some of the units higher and then the average revenue for the building is covering the operating costs. Um, that was sort of a, a technical way of saying that I see those moderate income units as a tool to get to the extremely low and very low income units and still have a financially sustainable building over the long term. Um, the second piece of the question, I should have written that down. Um, um, I'll just read, we believe that despite the large subsidy that should provide incentives for developers to select the lowest income band, the conflicting message of lease no. subsidy will right, direct thank developers. You. Um, that actually was the example that I gave you of, of comments that we got during the vetting process that I am 98% sure that we changed, that we made it clear that the language said lowest subsidy for that particular um, income band, mm -hmm. right? We, we want to make sure that we are sending the signal of don't pad your budgets, but, uh, but, but understanding lower income needs more subsidy and these term sheets are a very clear signal that we are going to pay for that. I have one more question that I'll note to my colleague, Council Member Rosenthal, and then I think we may hopefully get some of the advocates up. Um, the question is, is Ella's giving very generous financing in order to get for-profit developers to do the deep affordability units that mission-driven entities like CDCs and land trusts want to do? And I just wanted to get I want that question answered and just get the opinion of community land trusts to begin with. Sure. Um, the deep subsidies that we have in Ella are what we need to make projects financially viable. And the nonprofits and the for profit developers are working with very similar. Sorry, one second, because I, I know they're leaving. I want to just thank ANHD, who's still here, and Tenants and Neighbors uh, for their work. And I got a special soft spot for Tenants and Neighbors because I was the executive director for a while, and some of the board members are here that hired me. <laughs> so uh, thank you very much. Sorry, continue. No problem. Um, the subsidies that we in, that are in our term sheets are what are needed in most cases to make a project financially viable. Um, the four and the nonprofit developers are working with very similar sets of terms with respect to the interest rates that they're getting from, from banks, the low income housing tax credit raises, um, all of the other kind of external parameters that impact uh, how much it costs. The, Reality of it is that the combination of lower tax credit raises, higher construction costs, um, those, are, those are impacting all the developers, whether or not they're CDCs or for-profits, and then the dynamic that I was talking about previously where the projects worked pretty well if they were 30% homeless, but not so well if they were a mix of 30% AMI and homeless. Again, that affects anybody who is working with the term sheets. That was what we were trying to address with these higher subsidies. Um, so you think CDCs and community land trusts can still be viable over the for-profits? Absolutely. We, we value all of those partners. Um, 
we have been spending a lot of time thinking about how we can can support our the nonprofit development partners. Uh, one of the things that I'm uh, pleased about is that the acquisition loan fund, which was designed to help some of the smaller MWBEs and nonprofits acquire land and compete with the for-profits uh, that was recapitalized and is bigger than ever before. Um, so we, it's important to have the tools that will support the nonprofit partners, but yes, we work very closely with them. We want them to be um, using our term sheets. Uh, when I mentioned that in, in the testimony, some of the clarity issues, um, there are certainly terms that and policies that had existed that were familiar to some of the bigger developers who do multiple projects a year with HPD that were a little less clear to the nonprofits. So one of the things that we tried to do was make sure that everything was spelled out clearly and we were giving a, a even playing field to all involved. Uh, and if, I, if I could just add on, sure. on CLTs, on community land trust. Um, Thanks to a partnership with uh, Enterprise Community Partners, uh, HPD received a $1.65 million grant, and we did a request for expressions of interest across the city for community land trust to be formed. Um, and we were able to, we won that grant, and we're able to re grant that money out to four different entities to create community land trusts, um, three of which are. Uh, have, have concrete plans to create community land trusts. Um, and the fourth is going to be for a learning collaborative where um, about eight to ten of the applicants through the RFEI are going to work with uh, the new economy project to, to um, refine their plans to, in fact, develop a, a, some hard ideas around creating a, a real community land trust. Very uh, exciting. Who are the three and what areas are they looking at? Um, the three were um, the East Harlem El Barrio Community Land Trust in East Harlem, uh, Cooper Square, uh, which uh, is working both in Councilmember Mendez and, and Chin's districts, and um, uh, a group called the Interborough CLT, which is uh, um, Manny, Center for New York City Neighborhoods and Habitat for Humanity, which is looking to work across Queens, Brooklyn, and the Bronx. And you have as well as part of that. Are we, um, we going to be putting CLTs in the housing plan? We're looking at ways, the best ways to incorporate the CLTs in. I mean, right now, the grant that, that Jordan mentioned was just announced. Most of these groups, most of these groups are in, in formation stage right now and don't necessarily have the capacity to take on big new projects. But uh, we're looking at ways that they can support our initiatives um, and, and engage and that we can use, we can leverage the value that they bring. I think it's particularly of interest in the home ownership space and we're, um, I expect that we will see that grow in the future, but right now it is still in the, the planning and discussion phase. Thank you. I'm going to go to my colleague, uh, Council Member Rosenthal. Um, as more Council Members come, I'm getting a little nervous, but um, previously I have not set anyone on the clock. Everybody has been very responsible so far, and so my hope is that trend will continue so we don't have to use the clock, but uh, we'll go with Council Member Rosenthal. Thank you, Chair Williams. Uh, good to see you guys. Um, I'm wondering about the 10%, I think was the number set aside for the homeless in these developments. Are there supportive services going to be available for them in some way? For the most part, these are not supportive housing. Right. Set aside, right? Uh, occasionally a developer will incorporate a supportive housing component within the building and, and serve it this way, but um, these are families coming out of the shelter system and for most of them, they are very low income. They hit, uh, they hit whatever bump that they hit, but their particular challenge is a housing challenge. Um, as opposed to a, a social service challenge. So it, it is something that, it's a question we've heard a lot. Um, and I think there are probably is a tier of households that could benefit from, from some level of aftercare. Uh, I think we can talk about whether or not what, where you spent last night 
whether it was a shelter or precariously housed but not sheltered is what is where is the place to draw the line for the need for services um, what we do now is that we work very closely with partners that we have um, in an array of social service organizations many of our development partners have have social service components um, but short answer is no there isn't a formal component right now and so I'm not going to stay on this long but um, so you're talking about the way that you would get the homeless families you would work with those different shelters or with DHS I didn't quite understand the sure. last part of your question sure the homeless the homeless referrals come through DHS. They, okay. re they refer three households for every unit to make sure that we are able to fill those units. Um, they are families who have been in their shelter system. They are not particularly special needs populations. Right. And do you have a sense of demand for that? In that, uh, you know, what's the, does DHS, could they tell you in total there are 50 families like this, 100, 2,000. Even if the number's overwhelming, I'm right. just curious uh, of their families in shelters, how many are there because of the lack of affordable housing? Um, honestly, we have not had that conversation simply okay. because the demand is, in fact, so significant. Right. There's never been I don't a worry. Know. There, there's never been. Well, there's never been a worry that we're going to run out of homeless families for the. For no, the I'm thinking in the opposite direction. Created. I'm just under trying to understand what route to the numbers. What was your route to? What percentage would be at this? What percentage was that? What percentage was a different income band? Was it based on anything? Was it based on the financing? which is fine if that's the answer. Sure, thanks for the clarification, that is helpful. Um, it is a combination of the financing, but then also uh, the feedback that we've gotten about the need to make sure that we have both the 30% AMI units and the homeless units, uh, that we are trying to avoid setting up any kind of actual competition between those two legitimately housing need populations. Um, and and so we are, um, we were structuring the buildings to look for that kind of balance. Mm. I'd love to learn more, sure. but thank you. Happy to talk further. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Everybody's been very responsible with the with the time. Much appreciated. Um, I have one more question. What are HPD's most commonly used term sheets? What are the most popular term sheets in each of the boroughs? Let's see. Um, let me answer it generally, and we'll see if we can get the, the borough. The vast majority of the new construction units um, are Ella and Mix and Match. Um, those two programs account for, for well over half of new construction, and if you pull supportive housing out of that, it's going to be even higher. Um, preservation is much more, which we've talked less about today, but, but is an important part of our housing plan. Um, it's much more spread out and it varies more year by year simply because um, it, it depends a lot by which projects. There, there are sometimes very, very large projects in the preservation space, um, so, and those happen periodically, and, and it's, so it's a little bit of a lumpier uh, trend there. And we do, we do have the borough breakdown. I think it might actually be on our website of what we do by fiscal year. Um, or in, the, in the by the numbers page on the website, I just don't have it up my Okay, we, we can follow up with you on that. Thank you very much. That's all the, the questions I have. But I do think these plans are ambitious. I don't think they're ambitious enough face, based on what we're facing. I am happy with that the administration is moving in a direction that many of us have been pushing for, and these uh, term sheets seem to be in response to that, uh, which is great. Um, let's keep working together and pushing forward. Um, those of us that really want to see this happen are going to probably be relentless in um, pushing us forward, and I know some of the advocates will probably be even more relentless than us. So. Thank you for the feedback and for the continued collaboration. I appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you very much. We have one person signed up for uh, public testimony, Barika Williams, 
from ANHD. Can you please raise your right hand? Oh, this is new. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. And you can begin. Okay. Um, good morning. Um, my name is Barika Williams. I'm the deputy director at the Association for Neighborhood and Housing Development, ANHD, um, and you know us. So um, we just wanted to come and testify in terms of thinking about both what these term sheets are and how they fit into the broader housing New York plan um, and did some analysis for council members specifically on what the breakdown of the units are um, in terms of preservation and new construction at different AMI levels um, to get a little bit more in depth and really understand how they're contributing to addressing the affordable housing crisis. Um, I think fundamentally similar to what you testified, Chair Williams, um, our question is, are we, we deeply and, and completely agree that um, the city needs a big commitment on producing affordable housing. I think the question is, is the Housing New York plan as it's currently structured and its current affordability levels um, moving us forward in addressing the city's housing crisis? Um, and so what we have really been focused on is where is New York City's population in terms of what AMI levels New York City is made of and who is rent burdened in the city. Um, and so what that looks like is about 40% of New York makes below 50% um, AMI. Um, and that's actually what combines for what is now a higher number in the housing plan of 25%. Um, and that's a big mismatch right there um, in terms of where, where we're targeting to create in the housing plan versus what our population is. Um, the other piece that's critical in that is that is also the population that is who is rent burdened in the city. Um, so 68% of rent burdened households in New York City is in that group. Um, it's the vast majority of people in New York City who are struggling to pay their rent. Um, and yet that is actually exactly the inverse of how the plan is created right now. Most of the units um, are from 60% and above. Um, we just have the 25% below. Um, and so I think there's a lot of questions about how we move forward on a crisis when we're not actually targeting the population that is in crisis the most. Um, and then specifically, we also wanted to give council members some information that delved into what was happening in their boroughs uh, in a more detailed level. So for example, um, in the Bronx, the um, extremely low income and low income band together um, are about 58% of Bronx households. Um, and the ELI band is 40%. Um, that is only 28% of the new construction production so far, and it's only 14% of the preservation construction so far. Um, so there's also the huge mismatch that happens specifically in the boroughs, and which I'm sure is also replicated at community districts. Um, likewise, in Brooklyn, we've got 29% who are ELI and 15% who are VLI, compared to just 15% new construction uh, who are extremely low income in Brooklyn. Um, and 11% uh, preservation units. Um, so I think we, we kind of wanted to come and, and be a part of this conversation. We think under this administration, they've def definitely taken steps forward five, 10 years ago. If you had asked um, whether or not we could do 30% and 40% AMI units at all, I think we were hearing no. And so we know that our ability to do this is changing and part of what we feel like we and the housing community and what many council members have been partners in is continuing to push that because we know it's what our neighborhoods need, residents need, and what helps move us out of the housing crisis. So. 
Thank you very much for the testimony. I just wanted to be clear. So you have a chart, Housing New York, New Construction and Preservation. Is it, so it's a, is it 18% new construction plus 14% of new construction? 18% uh, of, 18% of um, Housing New York's new construction is ELI, and 14% of Housing New York's preservation is ELI. But then that's, that's 32%. Uh, but two different buckets. I think total combined, um, you see, do you know? I think combined, it's, it's, it's not 18%, it's not 32% total. There's overlapping there? Um, there's not overlap, but it's, um, it's not 32% of everything. Um, because when I asked, it? The, it was a um, little confusing, because when I asked them, they said 25% of both. They said their numbers ah. are 25% of both, preservation and construction. It looks like your numbers. Yeah. So the, the two, the 18% new construction and the 14% preservation combine to be 27% of the overall total. So 27% of their plan right now is ELI. Help me understand why that adds up. Oh, that's population. I'm sorry. Um, we can get you that number. Okay. About that. But I'm right, 18. It's not, the, it's not just the addition of the two. Okay, why not? Um, you want to, yeah. um, can we get a slip for her to fill out, and can you say your name if you're going to testify? Yeah. And please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Thank you. And yeah. can you state your name? Lucy Block with ANHD. Thank you. Um, so we don't have um, the combined total, but this is a, if you take the total uh, number of housing starts um, that have been created under Housing New York, um, it's not going to be 18 plus 14, but when you, when you break it into those two categories, one of them is 18% at ELI and one of them is 14% at ELI. So we could get you the number, but I believe it would be something like 16%. I don't understand that at all. Okay. <laughs> um, you'd have to, you'd have to, I it, don't understand. Um, it's, um, so we're doing percentages within one band and percentages within another band. When we I put, see, I yeah, see. Yeah, right. So we broke there. One of the concerns that we have always had and that one of the things that I think you all very correctly as council members asked us to address in giving this analysis is that the city reports on affordability levels for the overall numbers, right? So the city, as part of their press release, says we are doing X percent at ELI. Um, that's different than what the number of new construction units are at ELI okay. and what the number of preservation units are. I see. I got it. Thank you. And, uh, of course, the most poignant things are, and when I, one of them which I pointed out, is that most, uh, almost a majority of New Yorkers are on the ELI and VLI but that is not the majority by far of the housing plan. And as you added, the rent burden is um, 60 uh, percent that, of that of the rent burden is from that population. Also, from what I've generally seen, the higher up you go, the more available units you have, uh, which is also something that I don't think is taken into account. So there are some parts, I wouldn't say 80 percent AMI, but certainly when you go up to 100, 150, 160 percent of AMI, and market rate, um, you have more available units. So yes. So the difficult piece of this is that it's hard to get analysis on. Um, and really, the only time that we have definitive numbers on it are every three years when the new housing vacancy survey comes out. So at this point in time, any numbers that we could give are three to four years old because it's from a 2013, 2014 survey of the city. Um, we do know from sort of market reports and what comes out um, in folks who do more like tracking of the real estate market trends um, that there is a glut slash oversupply of high end units, right? So there are a lot of higher end units that are sitting on the market and not moving. 
Um, this is true for the extremely luxury um, uh, condo market, um, which is actually more concentrated in Manhattan. I think there was a piece just recently about um, uh, condo units being sold on the Upper East Side that had to drop their asking price by more than 40 to 50 percent in order to move. Um, and then on the rental side, um, what we do know in certain par pockets of the city is that we, it's hard to say oversupply, but that the markets, the number of units being created at certain price points are not necessarily matched with demand. Um, and that's something we're trying to figure out and understand better. Um, but for example, in downtown Brooklyn, there's a large supply of new market rate luxury units in downtown Brooklyn. It's pretty much everywhere you go, um, coming up Flatbush. Um, likewise, there will be another big chunk of those units coming on as Atlantic Yards can continues to move forward. Um, we do know that the, many of those units are offering incentives and um, other things to try to fill the units um, because as they are at their current asking rents, they weren't being taken up, um, which does create a challenge and a concern for us as overall as a city when we're creating lots of units that are priced um, at points that are not being taken up by the population. What's your opinion of the new term sheets in general and do you think we need to re, do we need to look at the, um, make adjustments to the housing plan that's out there now? Um, I think, I think we were pleased to see in the term sheets that the city is continuing to respond to housing advocates and push um, for more deep affordability. Um, I think we understand and appreciate that they made a shift recognizing that in the previous Ella term sheet that there was this unintended competition between homelessness and, and deep affordability units um, that none of us want to have um, folks competing around. At the same time, I think the struggle for us um, and for many of our, our communities is what is in the term sheets versus what communities need in order to feel like there's affordable, stable housing is not matching up, right? So they, the need and the desire is to have more units at deeper affordability levels. Um, and as um, I believe the representative from HPD testified, they, the city made a very calculated decision in MIH that they would rather have more affordable units at not a deeper affordability level. Um, and I think that's, that's something that many people feel like just doesn't, just doesn't line up with who the New York City population is, who needs housing, and where we should be prioritizing our city money. Oh. Okay, um, do you think it's just, this is uh, I think my last question, is it just an, a matter of additional funding or a matter of re reprioritizing where we're putting the money? Um, I actually think it's, it, it, Beyond the term sheets, I actually think it's bigger and broader than that. Um, I think the challenge is that we, the focus of the housing plan, and, and um, Molly Park from HPD is correct, it's, it's bigger and broader than just 200,000 units. But that is where most of our focus and much of our resources go when it comes to our housing plan. And that's about creating and preserving units, which is good, but the goal is not just to create the units. The goal is to get people where they're not forced to make bad decisions and decisions that they don't want to because they can't afford their rent, right? We don't want people choosing between food and medicine. We don't want people falling into homelessness. And so I think the real question that we should be starting with in the, in the housing plan is how can we move people out of a crisis? And part of that is units, but Creating units does not necessarily do that. And in some ways, I think we've really got to take a step back and rethink um, whether or not a unit-only focused goal actually moves us forward on the goal of having a more affordable New York. You say a unit-only focused goal. So we have to have a goal based on where we need to go? I'm, I'm gonna... Yeah, I mean, I, I think... I mean, this is obviously not what the city has done in their plan, right? But um, we could create 300,000 affordable units in whoever comes next in their housing plan, and they could do them all at $1,500 rent and above. 
It would be a big plan. It would cost us a lot of money. It would be very ambitious in scale, but it would not address our housing crisis, right? That, and we have to really have some tough conversations about what is our crisis now? It's not the same as 30 years ago um, when we first had our very first affordable housing plan that Koch laid out. Um, the challenges that neighborhoods are facing are not all the same as they were 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, right? So Flatbush, for example, what Flatbush neighborhood was struggling with 20 years ago is not at all the same as what it is today. And do we have the tools for what today's problems are? Is that where we're prioritizing our resources? And are we prioritizing outcomes that are tied to those problems, right? If the quintessential problem in many neighborhoods today is displacement, how are we saying, yes, we are doing better on displacement and this is a key benchmark of success in a plan, which is different than necessarily saying we need a lot of units in a neighborhood. Those two things can be the same, but they're not necessarily the same. I agree. I think which is why we pushed the previous mayor who finally agreed toward the end, and I think this mayor just assumed correctly that we should focus on preservation. So uh, most of the plan is on preservation where it should be. Great. Is that the type of thinking you're, you're saying? Should we be focusing more of the units on preservation? Should we be doing something else? Which I want to just align with what you're saying we should be doing and make sure, because it sounds like we do some of that in the housing plan with preservation, just not enough. We do, and we, we do, and we would completely agree with um, this mayor and previous administration's um, decision to focus more on preservation than new construction, and um, I think that that's something that we hope can continues um, going forward. Uh, but we do also need to look at the difference in, in AMI levels and what different people need and what things should be prioritized. So. Looking at the numbers, preservation has a smaller share of ELI units. We're actually having a very difficult time holding on to deeply affordable um, preservation units. Also a struggle with new construction units, um, but that then creates the, I mean, what, 40% 40, 40 of New Yorkers need a rent that is gonna be less than $1,200, $1,500 a month, and we lose about 11% of those units every three years, right? But just so I'm clear, of the, which I think they don't have enough of focus on the ELI and VLI, but of the ones they do have, a smaller percentage is on the preservation side? Yes, so far, That's and terrible. how the plan is moving forward. That's terrible. And, and, there are, and it, it's also discrepancies by Borough. So Staten Island had, and this is probably because they have one a big project, 46% of Staten Island's preservation units were ELI compared to only 11% of Brooklyn's preservation units were ELI, right? And so I think it's, it's digging into and understanding who were the populations in each of these neighborhoods, what do they need to actually stabilize their communities, um, what are additional tools that we weren't using before? And I think the city's done some of this in pushing forward on things like community land trusts and um, moving forward and signing right to council. But we do sort of need to take a step back and say we have been doing iterations on basically the same type of housing plan structure since the 70s, right? We, we, there's definitely changes in how we focus or how we think about things and how we target things, but it is a very similar template year after year through administrations. Um, and that might not work given where our neighborhoods are, are now compared to where they were 30, 40 years ago. Well, thank you very much. I yep. appreciate the testimony. Uh, I do know um, one thing that this plan did, which I think Koch didn't, was at least try to view neighborhoods more yes. holistically, yes. which is a, a, just a huge plus. Um, but thank you so much for your testimony. Thank you. I greatly appreciate it. I would like to call the administration back up um, very quickly. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, who's going to come back up to represent HPD? Can... Um, we get her to fill out a card, and can you please raise your right hand? 
Do you front and tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Don't worry, it's going to be relatively painless because yeah. I'm pretty sure I know what your answers are going to be. Yeah. <laughs> um, but um, there was one thing I just want to make sure I pointed out. I'm disturbed at the, uh, I mean, I don't like the number that's there, but the thing that must disturb me the most is that on the preservation side, uh, the VLI, ELI, uh, a lower share, uh, which is a critical part, because if they are a lower share, it doesn't matter if the plan is focused on preservation because we're not preserving the amount that we should be preserving. So I'm pretty sure what you're going to say, but I'd like to give you an opportunity to respond to that anyway. Sure. I'll take that question back and talk more and give you more answers at a later date. Speaking to the mic. Oh, yeah, sure. We'll get back to you with more information on that. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, testimony submitted for the record from tenants and neighbors. And with that, this hearing is now closed.